Greetings. I'd like to spend a little time talking about Chapter 10, Autoerotic Asphyxiation. Autoerotic asphyxiation is relatively rare, but it is important for um, students to understand, and especially those that are involved in the medical field and law enforcement um, and, and, and clinical areas such as counseling and social work and um, psychology, and uh, because this can be a, a, a fatal uh, situation. So it's very important to understand uh, this. Basically, when we think about autoerotic uh, asphyxiation, there's some different types. And in your textbook, uh, one of the main points is it's sex without a partner. Now, that is in many cases, but certainly there have been cases of asphyxiation with um, uh, partners, but autoerotic asphyxiation basically is sex without a partner. Um, you know, for example, masturbation is is um, uh, an example listed in your textbook, which usually is not dangerous, so we won't address that uh, behavior. But uh, the three other ones can be dangerous and fatal. For example, erotic asphyxiation is when one creates an oxygen deficiency, for example, by uh, strangling oneself with a rope around the neck or um, putting a bag over their head. Um, chemical eroticism is using some type of chemical to get that high or rush, such as Freon or some other uh, chemical. Uh, I remember back in the um, 1970s, people put uh, gas... Um, locks on, on their gas tanks because there was a huge fuel shortage and there were lines in gas stations. But another reason, I think, w was that teenagers and um, in, in the neighborhoods would um, sniff gasoline, would put their uh, nose into the uh, where you fill up uh, the gas tank and, and sniff the fumes till they got a high or they passed out, uh, which can be very dangerous as well. Also, there is a, um, a correctional typing fluid uh, some of you are wondering, typing, what are you talking about correction fluid? It's called backspace. Well, back in the uh, 70s and 80s, um, there were these devices called typewriters where you pressed a key and ink was um, then um, uh, you know, imprinted on a piece of paper through a metal key that you would strike. I'm sure most of you know what a typewriter is, but if you think about it, it certainly has been years since uh, you've probably uh, dealt with one. Uh, but there was a correction fluid that people would sniff as well uh, to get a high. And sometimes people use um, the um, whipped cream uh, canisters and, and, and the like. And then there's also aqua eroticism, which is the use of water. Um, what can happen, of course, in, in these cases is that uh, an investigator... Uh, or emergency personnel are called upon the scene and they're not quite sure how to differentiate off an autoerotic asphyxiation from, <clears throat> from suicide or from homicide or some other type of accident or autoerotic asphyxiation, which would really be uh, an accidental death. Uh, the, and also the crime scene may be contaminated or mo modified by family members or friends uh, because of the taboo regarding uh, sexuality and sexual behaviors and, and this type of behavior, they may uh, clean up some of the materials and um, it would then look more like perhaps a um, suicide. This is also should be differentiated from another dangerous activity, which is non-sexual, which is referred to as the choking game where uh, children and adolescents choke each other till they pass out. Um, I actually saw this back in... Um, in the uh, 70s and 80s with um, wrestling shows on television where they would uh, asphyxiate, uh, choke the person until they uh, passed out with some specific maneuver and then they'd slap them across the head to reawaken them. Um, today I think that that would be an outrageous uh, display uh, that would not be tolerated, but it certainly was something that was um, promoted and, and kids would play uh, championship wrestling games and uh, use all these uh, weird uh, maneuvers, dangerous maneuvers, I should say. Certainly the wrestlers uh, knew what they were doing in the ring, but kids and, and adolescents don't. The main motivation 
of autoerotic asphyxiation is to restrict the blood supply to the brain to obtain different sensations and this danger and the sensations may be exciting and also autoerotic asphyxiation may be related to other paraphilias which I mentioned before unusual sexual behaviors or other mental disorders as well and autoerotic asphyxiation usually is done in private and the person um, usually does not discuss this with others uh, some of the um, traits and characteristics of those who engage in this behavior it's um, more likely to be a male behavior although females have engaged in this behavior and have actually um, uh, had um, many dangerous situations as well. Uh, it tends to be among the younger age group, usually uh, Caucasian race, uh, people that are socially isolated and overachievers, uh, upper uh, socioeconomic status um, uh, level, um, and they also tend to be religious. And there's a lot of conflict there between their religious beliefs and, and their behavioral practices and the guilt associated with discussing. So, um, of course, if you're in the clinical field, it's very important to be non-judgmental and to um, uh, try to help the person work through their conflicts. And also suicidal tendencies, which can be extremely dangerous as well. Some of the indicators of autoerotic asphyxiation at the scene uh, may differ for men and women. Uh, for example, women are more likely to limit their uh, autoerotic asphyxiation practices to bedrooms or bathrooms and tend not to use sexual paraphernalia, while men um, have a more variety of locations and also are more likely to use some sexual paraphernalia. Uh, we might see cross-dressing among men, the use of mirrors, uh, pornography either on the floor or playing in a, uh, on a computer or a um, television. We might see tying up or genital binding uh, and also marks on the body and bruising that are self-inflicted and the person may also tie themselves up a self-bondage situation or handcuff themselves and we also might find diaries and writings or even pictures of uh, the person. We may see rope burns um, either in, in locations like on doors where um, it was uh, used to um, set up the, um, uh, the, the choking apparatus, or there may be some videos or, or pictures that are available at the, uh, at the scene. Also, the position of the knot in erotic hanging. The knot's usually in the back of the neck, uh, and that seems to be a preference of those who engage in autoerotic asphyxiation versus those who are engaging in suicide. They may actually have facial coverings. They may insert objects into their anus or they may have other uh, nipple clamps and other sexual paraphernalia. So um, I think what's real important is to recognize uh, that this is uh, something that uh, even though relatively rare can be and has been fatal and, um, and, and so it's important to educate uh, you know the professionals about this and also to focus on how to prevent this type of uh, behavior and it's also extremely it goes along in a very important way with um, uh, you know decreasing and and ending the choking game which um, uh, has resulted in deaths as well even though there's not a sexual component to it and and so these are very important uh, scenarios to study and, and to understand and this wraps up uh, this video.